All right. Um, today's workshop is called From Consultation to Meaningful Engagement with Indigenous and Marginalized Communities in Conservation, a larger project as a part of the Center for Collaborative Conservation's efforts in really looking critically at our field, the field of conservation and the ways in which folks have often not been included, have been left out, um, and also being a part of this movement right now that we see um, in collaborating and working um, with Indigenous folks, as well as uh, taking a step back and, and asking really who should be leading uh, this movement. And the purpose is to discuss some strategies for how we implement meaningful community engagement and go beyond consultation, which is uh, really a more of a surface level way of engaging with folks that we know the conservation field has a history of. And so how might we um, critically examine our own roles, our organizations, and the ways that we can affect positive change um, within our positions. And again, uh, this toolkit will be released on the CCC website under the resources tab. Um, here's a little preview of it. Um, again, we want to look at how this toolkit can be a really practical guide for academics, practitioners, students, and folks who have been working in collaborative conservation um, for a while, but may need some additional guidance on how to do so um, with tribal nations, um, indigenous communities, as well as other marginalized communities in conservation. How is it that we can support, include, and amplify their voices, priorities, and knowledges within the field? Um, we acknowledge also that there are many, many organizations and toolkits that are, exist already that have been doing this work. Um, the Kulana Noi'i is an excellent resource. Uh, via the Hawaii Sea Grant, and the goal of their toolkit was to promote more collaborative and mutually beneficial partnerships between Native Hawaiians, local communities, and researchers. Um, it's an excellent toolkit to check out if you do work um, with folks um, in the Pacific Islands, but also just generally to kind of learn about how folks are approaching this. And we also know the USDA, the Forest Service, is a, is a leader in this effort in collaborating with tribal nations. Their, their toolkit for their research department was to develop ethical and significant research partnerships um, with tribes that honor the, um, the trust responsibility of the United States um, and their relationship to tribes. We know that we are in a powerful moment right now where we have Secretary Deb Helland at the helm of the Department of the Interior, the first Native American person to ever be a, in the cabinet, right? Um, and we know that the Department of the Interior was actually created at the end of the 1800s to carry out westward expansion um, and essentially carry out dispossession of lands and uh, deal with the Indian problem, right? So we know the United States has a legacy and a history and even contemporary actions um, that have not worked with, uh, but truly against Native nations. So the fact that we have uh, Deb Haaland as a, the Department of Interior head is extremely significant. And we have seen uh, many outcomes from uh, her leadership so far. Um, on October 7th, 2021, Bears Ears National Monument was restored um, to its uh, original boundaries set during the Obama administration. Um, in November of 2021, she signed a joint order with Secretary Vilsack on fulfilling the trust responsibility to Indian tribes in the stewardship of federal lands and waters. And on the slide here, um, too, we see um, how Indigenous traditional ecological knowledge is going to be prioritized in federal decision making. And this is the first time in the history of the United States where the uh, leadership has acknowledged the importance of Indigenous knowledge. Um, and so this is a moment, this is a, a psychological shift that we see happening um, in the United States particularly, as well as in other areas of the world um, where engagement, um, empowerment, collaboration with the original stewards of the land is not just a nice add-on or a nice idea, 
but an essential part of, of our efforts in conservation. And so we know uh, a little bit about the reasons why community engagement hasn't always happened. Um, and those are often um, things that are really, really big, representational barriers, structural barriers, political barriers, um, really these legacies of exclusion, uh, legacies of marginalization. Um, and it's really critical for us as conservation practitioners to understand what barriers are in front of us for our particular organization or our particular project. Um, where are we located? Um, whose lands are we on? And really go through a process with your teams, um, with your collaborators to identify these particular barriers. And so some of the barriers that I'll mention today are, are sort of widespread, um, apply to most areas, and representational um, includes things like the images that we see about conservation, who are we quoting as our founding fathers of conservation, right? And we know uh, that the perspectives of conservation have uh, most definitely centered um, white men, uh, white wealthy men from the East Coast, um, folks who really uh, utilize conservation as a tool for justifying the westward expansion and disposition of lands um, in the name of conservation. Um, there's a lot of excellent authors, scholars, and activists who have been talking about this for a long time. Um, you know, the image on the left here is an image um, called American Progress that was meant to really represent Manifest Destiny or this idea that uh, westward expansion in the United States was, um, was sort of God's call. Um, and uh, I would argue that uh, conservation still is recovering from that legacy um, of, of sort of this wild, wild west and um, this pristine wilderness that must be cared for and protected. Um, we also know in the United States specifically, um, as well as in other countries such as Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um, that there are some pretty heavy structural barriers uh, to community engagement, such as um, really marginalizing folks via um, the reservation system, um, via uh, land tenure or land dispossession, um, different policy and regulatory acts that really limit participation of indigenous communities and tribal nations. Um, we know that uh, we are a part of a, a capitalist um, imperialist system that um, that you know often excludes certain people and lifts others. Um, so again, these are these are big issues that, that not a single person or community can dismantle, right? But they are ones that we absolutely must acknowledge and recognize are, are present. Um, we also have uh, more organizational or political um, concerns. Um, I um, use Colorado Parks and Wildlife as um, an example of an agency that has not necessarily engaged deeply with uh, tribal engagement. Um, as a state agency, they are not mandated in similar ways as a, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and we kind of haven't seen this engagement with the indigenous peoples of Colorado, um, where to me it is a sort of a missed opportunity. And even at Colorado State University uh, land grant, we often um, are meant to really support uh, efforts and uh, make sure that our research has tangible impacts, but um, often we defer to the agencies uh, to do that work. So you can kind of see real quick how uh, community engagement uh, becomes complex, um, how it can lead to marginalization of folks, um, breaking down of community and trust and all of that. So. Um, it is important to mention that uh, the barriers are critical to identify um, right off the bat, um, not just from our perspectives of as collaborative conservation practitioners, but uh, from the perspective of the community. Um, and really, we'll talk about how, how we might get to that. And so part one is really defining community, really understanding who it is that we seek to work with, build trust with, um, potentially repair relationships with. Um, in the United States, um, and we will get to some international examples as well, but in the United States, we have 574 federally recognized um, American Indian Alaska Native 
tribes, nations, villages, um, as well as many other nations and peoples that are unrecognized by the state, um, including indigenous Mexicans, um, indigenous Puerto Ricans, native Hawaiians, um, and more. And so uh, with the 574 federally recognized tribes, um, there are constitutional level and legal mandates that are important to acknowledge. So if you work for a federal agency, hopefully this is old news and you are aware of this and you understand this nation to nation relationship that the United States has with the 574 sovereign nations. Um, but often many of us are working for nonprofits, state agencies, counties and cities where we may not be aware of these protocols or this sort of legal context. Um, so we may fail to follow some basic protocols um, and really understand this legal history and this legal background that is important um, when talking about land stewardship. Um, so we have six, 63 state recognized tribes as well um, that for folks, especially in um, the Southeast um, are likely, it's important to understand that history and sort of the role that the state has um, with those tribes. But for the most part, um, the federal protections are, are only going to be relevant for the 574 federally recognized tribes. Um, so here is one of uh, the basic sort of protocols or, um, on how tribal consultation occurs between um, the United States Congress and um, tribal nations. Um, we know in conservation specifically, um, after the executive orders were signed by Deb Helen and um, Secretary Vilsack, that there was really this reinvigoration um, of uh, acknowledging the United States trust responsibility to tribes um, and, and seeking to collaborate from on a nation to nation basis. So in 2022, we know that uh, the DOI signed over 20 new co-stewardship agreements with tribes. Um, there's an additional 60 agreements that are at various stages of approval that we know are occurring. Um, so again, this is happening. Um, th these are things to really try to stay up to date on as much as possible, um, because this is happening at the federal uh, agency level on um, federal lands. And so we'll talk about other examples too. Um, what about um, inter on the international scale and the local scale where there isn't that sort of federal um, level of, of energy going on? So um, in the United States too, we have folks like Native Hawaiians, Indigenous Puerto Ricans, and others who are unrecognized. So we may need to really think carefully about um, some different ways to engage with these communities who are asserting their inherent sovereignty, but do not have the United States or their nation sort of uh, backing them or with having protocols on how to engage with them. Um, I have worked in Guatemala for over 10 years um, at various uh, organizations and throughout my research um, and know that, uh, you know, Guatem indigenous Guatemalans are constantly asserting their sovereignty and trying to fight for basic recognition um, for their territorial rights, um, their cultural ways of life, their food systems. Um, and we know the state of Guatemala does not formally recognize them as sovereign nations or peoples. Um, despite the fact that Guatemala is the second highest population of indigenous folks across all of Latin America. So we have to be aware of these dynamics. Again, we mentioned um, sort of imperialism and, and these other big uh, political systems that we know are designed to not recognize and not include indigenous peoples. So the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, also known as UNDRIP, is an excellent resource for anybody working um, outside of the U.S. or internationally um, with local communities and Indigenous peoples um, to really understand, all right, what are, what are the international level rights that folks have? And so um, there are over 40 articles in UNDRIP, Article 25, I, I used as an example here to show that in conservation or in land stewardship, indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their relationships with traditionally owned or occupied lands, territories, waters, seas, and other resources. Um, so it is uh, definitely our recommendation to check out UNDRIP, uh, this resource you can find it on the United Nations website and it will be in the toolkit as well. 
So again, we talked a little bit about some legal background, but also it is important to, to when engaging with a community, understand their story, understand how they identify themselves. Um, often it's a lot more um, complex than we would find online or find um, in a dissertation, right? So it really means that we need to be there, um, sit with people, listen with, um, listen to them, um, be in community with them, right? Um, in my experience working with the community La Bendición in southeastern Guatemala, um, they're actually comprised of numerous different uh, Mayan uh, nations, multicultural uh, mestizo folks, um, and they were displaced after the armed conflict. And for decades, the community has fought to uh, get their land title from the government. Um, it took about 25 years of really active uh, work, collaborating with organization called Utsche and Trees, Water, and People here in Fort Collins to really get that land title. Um, in 2022, they finally did receive that land title and that formal recognition from the state that these are their lands. They are a sovereign uh, community that can um, be self-determined, right? But it took a lot of effort. And in partnership with two nonprofit agencies, they were able to get that recognition, um, just get that additional support. Um, so there are really, really profound and um impactful outcomes that can come when there is meaningful engagement with communities, such as a community getting um, their territorial rights acknowledged, right? So this is why we care about this work, because we've seen examples of it um, being successful. We know it takes a long time, and it is not glamorous in any way, shape, or form. So if uh, this is a path that you're seeking to go down for your um, sort of life's work, your, your career, um, you know, know that there are some, some good examples out there and, and leaders out there who can show you the way, um, but it really does take that um, dedication on your, your part to really learn this process. Um, just a few photos of La Mendicion um, and, and their efforts in reclaiming uh, the land title. Um, been a privilege to work with them for, for almost 10 years. So in addition to thinking about sort of the legal and inherent sovereignty um, of the community you may be working with, it's also important to go, okay, whose lands are we on? What is the story of this place? What has happened here? Who is here now? And who has stewarded these lands um, for a very long time, right? Since time immemorial. The, those, that's a historical context that's really critical to know. Um, if you're working in the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um, it's, it's important to look at treaty lands. Um, is the conservation project that you are carrying out occurring on treaty lands? If so, there's going to be some considerations that your nonprofit, state, or federal agency will need to consider. Um, and even regardless of treaty lands, we know that all national parks in the United States are the ancestral homelands of um, many, many nations and peoples, um, culturally significant sites. Um, so we need to kind of expand our ideas of the land, right? It's not just this uh, sort of jurisdictional um, viewpoint, but really we need to look at the long history of the land and who's there and who and who's being left out. Um, so the Poudre River is uh, our lovely, famous river, if you will, here in Fort Collins. Um, a lot of people come to Fort Collins to see the Poudre River. Um, and we know that it's the ancestral homelands of many, many nations and peoples, um, particularly the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. So the city of Fort Collins has started to take an initiative to um, develop some consultation protocols, improve engagement with uh, indigenous communities, um, people in Fort Collins. And uh, this is a fairly new effort, right? Um, but the city of Fort Collins knows um, that it must begin by repairing a relationship, um, engaging with and listening with the community. And they've also hired an entire team now that is carrying out this effort. There are three folks here um, that are working to build a relationship and establish um, 
projects um, with the Indigenous community in Fort Collins. So we know it's possible um, to do, but it uh, is a bit overdue, right? It's it's um, taken this long to kind of get to the point where the city feels comfortable um, that they can take action on this. So um, again, look at where you're working, where is your organization based, generally where are your projects occurring, the communities that you serve, um, see what others are doing in your community to engage with folks. Because you may realize, um, especially if you work in Fort Collins, um, this may be the first time you've heard of the consultation and engagement efforts going on with the Indigenous community. A really helpful resource to start is nativeland.ca can be a neat way to look at the treaty maps. You can actually read the original treaty language and start to understand a little bit of, of what's happened um, in terms of the settler colonial context, but also the ancestral um, and territorial um, presence of folks um, coming from uh, sovereign nations. So Colorado State University, we're a land grant university. We also are um, engaging with these meaningful um, consultation or meaningful engagement practices with Native American and Indigenous communities. We now have a new assistant vice president working on this um, that uh, is really new, right? So less than uh, six months, uh, this person has been in this position, but we know this is a, an action that has been taken by CSU to really work on this. Um, I'd be curious to know um, if others of you at uh, other universities in the West um, are engaging in these efforts, um, but, but the CSU is really um, attempting to uh, build, rebuild and repair some relationships and hopefully collaborate with uh, tribes in the process. Um, so to kind of get ready to conclude this part, you know, if, if thus far in listening to the workshop, you've determined that, you know, your nonprofit or your organization or your projects don't really partner with not with Indigenous folks or, or maybe you're partnering with mostly non-Native folks, that that's our right. It may be something that you revisit uh, just to make sure, man, is, the, is it that there should be a collaboration with Indigenous and Native folks, but there isn't. Um, as I mentioned before, Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, is does not have necessarily the federal mandates um, to engage with uh, tribes in land stewardship. However, um, there is an effort in the state of Colorado going on right now to change that. Um, 46 of the 48 Native nations that have historical presence in the state of Colorado were removed from the state of Colorado in a very short period of time during the Civil War, um, including my ancestors and my family, right? So how do we re reconcile that? How do we look at Colorado Parks and Wildlife from the lens of the removal of the folks from these lands? Um, essentially, Colorado's public lands are Indigenous lands, yet um, there's a really big gap in engagement with the communities, right? So should CPW seek to better engage with tribes? Um, I would argue yes. Um, and there's nothing preventing CPW from, from going the extra mile and doing that. Say, I could argue the same for our small nonprofits, right? But we don't wanna go in there um, without the training and without the know-how and without the trust of the community. So we at the CCC really encourage starting small, um, really doing personal and organizational level work before uh, seeking to engage. Um, I happen to know CPW is in the really early stages um, of looking at this, but I use them as a as an example um, just because of how much potential there is to really work more collaboratively with um, and in partnership with the original stewards of these beautiful lands here in Colorado. And so to recap, um, legal context, really critical, especially in the United States to understand um, sort of what the lay of the land is literally, but also looking at some of the international standards too for folks who are unrecognized. Um, make sure that you're listening to how the community identifies themselves and 
asserts their sovereignty, regardless of what the state says or doesn't say about them. Whose land are you on? It's really critical to look at the history of these lands. Um, there's so many resources out there to do that. Um, we really encourage you to, to engage in that, um, that deep work. And then again, who isn't here? Um, should you be working with Native and Indigenous communities but your organization hasn't thus far? Um, it's important to consider the, the reasons why um, they may not be at the table. Um, as we mentioned, there's a lot of barriers and structural things keeping folks from engaging um, or keeping organizations from, um, from doing the right thing, right? Um, so now that we kind of understand a little bit more about um, who we might want to work with, who we might want to expand our collaborations with, now it's important to understand um, how do we define engagement. Um, and the toolkit we will release this summer will give you some really good ideas of sort of where you can start um, if you'd like to be uh, in a more, um, a deeper relationship with a community, we can give some advice on how you might do that, um, as opposed to just doing that surface level consultation that we've seen time and time again in the conservation field. Um, so I'd love to bring in uh, my friend and colleague, Dominique David Chavez, and her work on looking at uh, assessing the levels of Indigenous community participation in climate change research. Um, her research found that the vast majority of climate change research projects do not include Indigenous communities. They are contractual at best, um, extractive certainly. And so through her research that I really recommend you check out, um, she developed a tool to really assess the different level of engagement that you can have um, with folks in climate change research. and. Um, Really, what we encourage is to move more towards the right hand side, um, really trying to find these deeper, slower relationships with communities where they are leading the effort, defining the process, the priorities, and um, that these efforts are centered on Indigenous knowledges, um, values. And Western science then can be a smaller partner in the effort. Um, but again, the community is leading this and they are inviting you to uh, sort of collaborate on a, a particular aspect of a project. Um, some of the questions uh, that Dominique uh, David Chavez, um, who is a professor here at CSU in the Forestry and Rangeland Stewardship Department at CSU, is sort of looking at the full project cycle. So the initiation and planning phase, have Indigenous community members been included in the uh, decision to initiate the project? Or was this sort of a top-down approach where you're scrambling to engage people at the end? You know, that's not what we want. Um, to what level have Indigenous community members give, um, have or been given the authority in the project design, planning, and implementation? Um, and then again, just looking at how we can build in flexible timelines, funding structures, and implementation plans that are going to allow flexibility if and when um, community priorities shift, which we know that they do. Um, there is a whole com research community dedicated to the ethical guidelines of engaging with Indigenous um, and Native communities. Um, and so we won't get so much into that today, but we do encourage you to check out the various resources um, out there. And then again, in the project implementation and sort of um, evaluation phase, the outcomes from the project should be accessible um, to Indigenous community members. Often that goes beyond just a scientific article or publication, right? Or um, some internal report at an agency that a community member will never see, right? So how do we actually build in um, this additional um, but more meaningful approach to communicating about a project and their outcomes. Um, you can read through some of the additional questions here, but I really encourage you to read Dominique's work for yourself and kind of get into some of the points that she found, particularly around climate change research. Um, so when it comes to collaborative conservation, 
big box, a uh, big text box, a lot of text. Uh, we don't expect you to read this right now. But the CCC felt that we needed to develop a similar uh, scale, but for practitioners who are working in conservation and practitioners who are working in collaborative conservation, um, where there's multiple um, agencies, organizations, communities involved to solve a problem and work together in a way that would have a greater impact than if they worked alone in isolation, right? And so Again, um, we provide some guidance on where kind of identifying where you might be at currently at your organization or for a particular project and where how to sort of move more towards the collaborate and empower stage where community voices, inherent sovereignty and um, histories of the land are included um, and acknowledged significantly. Um, so I like to start at the bottom of this chart, role of the partner, and um, that really helps me go, all right, here's where this project is at. And for the most part, um, in the conservation field, we tend to stay in the inform and consult phase. Um, and yet there's this passion and interest to move more towards involve, collaborate, and empower. And so... Um, you know, for advocates, for the role of a partner, you say, hey, let's work together to solve this problem, um, right? Maybe there's an issue going on with fire uh, suppression in California, and um, Western scientists are really seeking to collaborate with the California uh, Native tribes there to understand how the Forest Service can learn from um, Indigenous approaches um, and collaborate. Um, but moving towards Empower, uh, you know, this is more, hey, you care about this issue and are leading this initiative. How can we support you? How can we uh, be a small part of this initiative to help you keep moving forward with what you're doing? And um, this is where, in my opinion, the, the best uh, collaboration happens because, again, um, we're identifying a really specific way for ourselves or our organizations to contribute to an existing effort that a community has been leading for maybe decades, for maybe centuries, um, but hasn't really received the uh, support, maybe needs some researchers to, to um, help document what's going on, or maybe needs some help administratively getting funding uh, developing reports. There's a lot of different ways in which um, Indigenous and tribal communities are doing this work, but could be uh, supported. Um, and so we talk a lot about that in um, in the toolkit and with a specific examples as well. Uh, but as you can see, the participatory power, agency, and shared decision authority increases as we move um, more to the right here. And so to kind of wrap up uh, some of the, the takeaways that we hope that you'll get from the toolkit um, and from just sort of engaging in this work a little bit more, um, I like to think of this, does it, did anybody grow up in the 90s and watch the Animaniacs, uh, the Good Idea, Bad Idea show? Um, that was my favorite show when I was growing up and it just made me think of this last night. Um, <laughs> but uh, we offered to you five pillars um, for beginning new relationships or new partnerships with tribes. Um, and, and also this could apply to you if you've already established a partnership, but it maybe doesn't feel right. It doesn't, you know, you maybe aren't sure where you're at if you're having the impact that you want to have and if you're being reciprocal. Um, so we'll go through uh, some of these. Um, common pitfalls, I bet you could read through that uh, part of the chart and go, oh, either I've done that or my organization's done that or I've seen that happen. Um, so it's really much better to have a face-to-face, -face, sit down, um, informal meeting to establish a relationship outside of a context of a project, right? You're not coming with any um, expectations or you're not hoping to, hey, you want to be on my project. You're really just going because you are, are seeking to build a relationship. I often see this. I see this all the time. Um, often we as academics or practitioners, we've got grant deadlines and it would be really great if we could have a community involved or a tribe, right? But then you, um, or that's sort of an extractive pattern where you're emailing or contacting way too late in the game. Um, 
to to see if a community would like to collaborate. So we really discourage um, that approach. Um, it's much better to first listen and learn about the community, their concerns, values, and aspirations. Um, their concerns, values, and aspirations. That is going to be really difficult to find online in a book, in an article, right? You actually have to sit with people um, and listen to them. And, um, you know, imagine that you are, are in that space. It's really important to not take up too much space, um, ask permission to speak and speak um, a little bit, uh, really don't uh, dominate the, the area. It's um, something that I've seen happen and um, just really, really practice uh, listening um, and really, really limiting your speaking time because um, that can kind of communicate this message that, that you are the expert and you have knowledge or power that the community doesn't um, when really um, the opposite may be, may be true. Um, we really encourage starting small. Um, develop a very flexible um, initial effort together that can establish a working relationship. You'll figure out how to work together, figure out how to communicate. Um, you'll be going, um, you know, to them, they'll be coming to you. And it's really this exercise and, and practice of figuring out, do we enjoy working together? Is this working? Um, and uh, we believe that this occurs upon invitation by the community to engage in an effort. Um, you know, this will happen over time. This may take a year, two or three years before you actually get to this small project that you develop together. Um, a common pitfall is like forcing this collaboration. Uh, maybe you have a, a four-year uh, time limit on this grant and you really need to get going. Um, maybe you're doing your PhD and you need to get your proposal done. Um, we discourage this sort of time-limited forced collaboration um, just because it, it won't send a good message to the community and they're going to see it right away. Um, so please take your time. Um, and know that maybe you're, it's not the time to engage with Indigenous and Native communities. Maybe you're at the stage in your career, you're at an organization, um, or you're in school, and it, it may just not be the right time. And that's okay, and that is an important part of identifying sort of where you are. Um, and we need to talk about Indigenous knowledges, right? It's all over the place right now, integrating Indigenous knowledge into um, our conservation efforts. But what point I really want to make clear is that Indigenous knowledge cannot be separated from Indigenous people, right? If you're going to partner with tribal nations and Indigenous communities to apply Indigenous knowledge to a particular um, project, effort, um, as an intellectual partner to Western science, the Indigenous people need to be there. Um, this isn't something that you can sort of do um, on the side, right, um, without the Indigenous people with the knowledge at the table. Um, I unfortunately, I'm seeing this pattern a lot, um, especially in um, ecology, um, wildlife conservation, um, and, and it's just really important to remember that Indigenous knowledge is attached uh, to a person. Um, and to a community and a, a land. And lastly, um, we really need to slow down um, and build time to reflect as a practitioner community team to ensure that this collaboration is, is reciprocal, that it is being mutually beneficial. Um, so checking in with each other, making a space to be together outside of the project. Um, when I'm collaborating with Indigenous communities, um, it's like, you know, we're, fr we're friends, we're family. I ask, hey, how's your grandma? How's your mom? Um, you know, when when's your uh, daughter um, finishing up high school? Let's celebrate. Let's do something. Um, food is involved. There's always food, you guys. Um, so we need to really work on building these um, these authentic relationships with, with our um, community partners to the point where um, we feel really good on both sides that, you know, we want to continue this relationship. We trust each other. This is mutually beneficial. Um, last night at a happy hour with the CCC, we were talking about how sometimes uh, our primarily non-Native organizations 
can go, man, everything's going great. We assume the project is going well. We're doing amazing on DEI. Um, but that's not what the community says, right? And so we need to, to be really careful that we're after we have some data to go behind um, our claims that things are going well, and we need to be able to build in this reflection process um, to, to be really sure about it and not have any guesses. Um, so this is just a really quick summary of some of the learnings and um, approaches in the toolkit that we hope you'll check out later this summer. Um, of course, uh, there's so many other resources that other organizations have developed that uh, we look up to a lot and we encourage you to check out. Um, but with that, we'll kind of wrap up the, the lecture part of the workshop, and we're going to take the next 25 minutes to work together again and break out and start to practice some of these concepts with each other. Um, and we would love uh, for everyone to feel that this is a, a space to make mistakes, uh, to um, feel safe, uh, that sort of what happens in our breakout rooms is um, all in good spirit and um, that there's not judgment. And so, um, again, uh, like Allison said at the beginning, we need to practice and engage uh, with these concepts in order to feel ready uh, to actually carry them out. Um, so what we're going to do is we will have another Jamboard, which you all are experts on already, and you'll have 15 minutes with uh, your group to answer the following questions. Um, it will help if you have one person to kind of be the Jamboard um, expert or uh, note taker, and we'd love to understand your context, your job title, and the type of organization that you're from, and describe what potential outcomes your organization could achieve or wants to achieve through community engagement. Um, that'll be the first Jamboard. Um, and the second uh, Jamboard will be within your sphere of influence. So think about your role at your organization, um, your how long you've been in the community that you're in, um, your expertise, um, what are some tangible steps that you can take within your role or organization to understand the concerns, values, and aspirations of the community or tribal nation you seek to work with? And so this might take um, some brainstorming, but also some, um, you know, if you're if you aren't engaging with the community yet, you may try to think a little bit down the line. Uh, where would you like to be? Does that make sense? We will, um, it's the same Jamboard link that you received earlier. Um, and you will go ahead and click that. And thank you, Allison. Great. And so um, I put the link for the Jamboard in. Um, on Jamboard number four, I uh, took the liberty of grabbing some of the words that you all used when you all feel included. And so again, sort of eye on the prize as you engage in this exercise, these are some of the things you're going for, right? Um, and then on Jamboard number five, I'm right up here, is where um, the first uh, uh, part of the, of the exercise is. And then uh, you can use Jamboard number six for that. And then Jan board number seven is the second one. Questions? Um, uh, before we go in though, uh, um, there is one question, Jim, uh, um, from uh, Audrey. Can you please elaborate oh, what yes. that means? Yes, Audrey, um, thank you for that uh, comment. Audrey said, can you please elaborate on what it means, on, on what in doubt, what it means to say indigenous knowledge cannot be separated from indigenous people. Can you give examples? Um, yes, I can. Um, and so what, I, what I'm seeing um, a little bit is I'll see a non-native scientist trying to learn everything they can about maybe a traditional ecological knowledge about uh, moose, let's say, or elk, um, and just sort of take that almost as like information that they say, okay, I included the traditional ecological knowledge in my project because I 
went to a talk or I read a book. Um, but that isn't, that's kind of an extractive approach to understanding um, the relationship that people may have with moose. And so we really encourage you to only use indigenous ecological knowledge if you've received the permission to do so, and if you've engaged with people themselves and understood, um, you know, where where they're at with that. So really, um, we don't want it to be just another way for scientists to say, um, hey, I'm including indigenous knowledge in my project, right? We want the people to be at the table. Um, I hope that clarifies um, and uh, would love to chat um, if you have other questions. 